After many multi-million dollar investments, will the West finally secure its own supply of rare earths? I'm with Louisa Moreno. She is director at Defense Metals and a longtime rare earth analyst. Louisa, welcome to Kitco. Hi, Michael. Thank you for having me. Uh, this month, MP Materials announced a $58 million grant from the Department of Energy to build a manufacturing facility in Texas for processing rare earth. The Canadian government has also announced smaller funding packages for pilot plants in Ontario, Saskatchewan in the past year. Um, are we on the path to rare earth independence, Louisa? I think we are. I think we are closer. Uh, we have seen governments around the world um, more interested in supporting um, the development of strategic metals, um, particularly rare earths. In Australia, for instance, we saw the Australian government announcing an investment of $1.2 uh, billion to uh, ILUCA. Uh, so that is very positive. Uh, there are a number of import-export funds uh, and other government organizations that have signal interest in investing in rare earth projects around the world. So that is significantly important uh, to start developing more rapidly a supply chain outside uh, Asia, outside China. Um, but um, there's more to, to do, certainly. Uh, we've seen what has happened uh, with uh, nickel in Indonesia, with uh, the prices of nickel have just uh, collapsed right now, and then that's also resulted in mine closures. Talk a little bit about uh, rare earth prices. Uh, do we see a support of rare earth prices, or at least support of rare earth prices projected? In the long term, we, we believe that's, uh, that support is going to be there. Uh, but across the board, if you look at uh, lithium, as you likely know, prices have come down from $80,000 per ton to about $15 uh, per ton. And you, saw, you mentioned nickel, I think they're down about 40 plus percent. Uh, and many other strategic metals are facing the same. Um, and, um, and, and rare earth is no exception. So prices have uh, fallen. And so if we take as a reference, neodymium, uh, tresodymium, uh, those prices have fallen as well uh, to about in China. I think they're currently around $50, $70 per kilo. Now, rare earths, as you made uh, the remark, is strategic. And then that's why some of the governments are getting involved. But uh, China's really owned uh, the market up. Uh, they've just owned the market in rare earths. They do. They, they control uh, the market. They're the largest producers, 60, 70 percent. Some analysts have estimated. Uh, but more importantly is the refining. They control more than 85 percent of the refining and the supply chain. So essentially, they're also producers of most of the uh, final products, uh, including magnets and electric motors that go into electric vehicles. So certainly they have a very uh, strong hold uh, on, on the supply chain of rare earths. Uh, you were talking about uh, in the long term that you're going to see that rare earth prices are going to be supported. How is uh, the uh, demand picture look? Uh, what gives you uh, optimism that uh, prices should rise? So if you look at demand for rare earth, um, you know, even as a proxy, the production it's, as well, um, you know, it went uh, from about 100, 110,000 about uh, 10, 12 years ago. And today, the estimates uh, of demand for rare earth are around 250 to 300,000 tons per year. So that's quite significant. And that is without uh, seeing uh, a significant increase in production uh, of electric vehicles, um, because the projections of demand for rare earth, particularly the magnet elements, um, is uh, estimated to lead to an increase in demand for total rare earth of about 200,000 tons in the next 10 years or so. So that is where we, we are heading uh, as, um, you know, the phase out of uh, internal combustion engines sort of happened. Uh, but as I mentioned, even before that's happening, we already saw uh, rare earth uh, production more, more than double, and that's from natural demand from other applications. So demand for rare earth is very, very healthy. Uh, it's used... Uh, as I mentioned, electric vehicles, but also military applications in medicine, agriculture, you name it. 
Explain what's uh, tricky about uh, rare earths. Um, it, it's kind of like lithium, correct? Uh, there's a lot of the element everywhere, but it just has to do with the issue of like uh, how easy it is to uh, process and able to uh, how how the mineral how the metallurgy is working. Yeah, metal metallurgy is definitely key uh, for strategic metals, and uh, rare earths is, is no different. For the most part, if you have a gold deposit. You don't need very sophisticated groups of people to be able to, um, you know, recover uh, gold and, and sell it. A lot of the gold in Africa and South America today is still produced from artisanal, artisanal and small scale miners. Uh, that is, we will never see refining of, of rare earth uh, than um, you know it's such a simple uh, you know uh, process. It, it's it's rather complex. To to um, to produce uh, rare earth in its, its different stages. Of course, you have to upgrade uh, if it's a hard rock to to mineral concentrate, and then you have the metallurgy, the hydrometallurgy, and then the separation, refining of each one of these elements. And every single one of these stages is is complex. But what makes it even more complex is that it is deposit sensitive. So every deposit, um, every project. Um, every company has to develop their own flow sheet to recover and extract uh, their rare earths. So in a way, it is, it is actually perhaps a bit more complex than lithium. Talk a little bit about more about uh, that flow sheet. What do you mean? So in, in terms of the, the flow sheet, the mythological flow sheet. Um, so what I'm talking about is the extraction and, recover and recovery of, uh, of the rare earth. So... The rare earth in different deposits uh, might be found uh, in different minerals, uh, or even if you are similar minerals, uh, they might be found in different concentrations. You know, so for instance, some of the more common minerals for rare earth is monazite and bosnite. But uh, in a deposit like Wachita, we have about 50-50 monazite and bosnite. Uh, MP materials, for instance, is mostly bosnite. Um, Somebody like I look at, they have monazite, but that monazite is actually in heavy mineral sense, which is different from our carbonatite deposit. <laughs> so we all have different processes. The first stage is to produce a flotation concentrate, and the way we do it uh, is different uh, from the way I look at would do it, uh, and different from how uh, MP materials will do it at Mount Pass. And, and so the same thing for the hydrometallurgy, different processes, and, and ultimately the separation. That's probably a bit more off shelf <laughs> a little bit, but uh, again, depends on the concentrations of of, of the rare earth, uh, because we might have uh, 16, 15% NDPR, others might, might have more or less, and depending of, of what you have, the elements you have and the percentage of, of those elements, you're gonna have to adjust your solvent extraction accordingly. So it varies. Now, uh, Luis, I'm going to lean on lithium again. There's been a lot of notable investment uh, into the space looking at novel ways of processing. Has there been any notable developments in the rare earth side? Um, yes, uh, but uh, lithium, again, uh, in, in North America with, with the brines, there's been a lot of uh, development in DLI, direct lithium extraction. Uh, there's different uh, types of technologies. Uh, solvent extraction, ion exchange, membrane. I mean, it just varies. It goes on and on. So in that sense, it's it's, it's a little bit similar to to, to rare earth. Um, but uh, once uh, one of those uh, technologies works, it's, it's likely potentially uh, possible to to work for other similar uh, brine brine deposits. But for for rare earth, uh, we know more or less the technologies that. That we use for, for instance, Wachi, that we use um, acid bake for the hydrometallurgy, and that is what is used mostly in China as well, and this is what liners use. But we will have to utilize that technology specifically for our deposit, and considering the type of concentrate that goes in the feed uh, that goes into our plant. So there's a number of variables, and we have to adjust that. The actual technology is known. Um, but and then we have to tweak it to to the type of ore that we have and the type of impurities. 
Um, I want to uh, get to defense medals in a minute where your director, as I mentioned at the top, uh, you did have an announcement. But um, let's just uh, step back for a minute. Um, talking about either the miners or developers, or is there any uh, particular milestones that you're paying attention to in the space? Uh, is there any developments that are of interest to you? Yes, it's always interesting for us uh, to see how uh, our peers uh, advance. It's important to have more production uh, outside uh, Asia, outside China specifically. And uh, so we continue following uh, the various players. It's very exciting to see major companies like I look, uh, mentioned earlier in Australia uh, that is interested to start processing. Uh, well, actually, they've been selling their monazite and and looking at going more downstream uh, to, to, to refine and extract uh, rare earths. So we continue looking at that very closely. Um, it's no secret that everybody is talking to everybody. Uh, by, by that I mean empty materials with, uh, with liners. Uh, um, I look uh, looking to uh, other companies as well. Um, major companies that are going downstream are looking for feedstock. Uh, companies like ourselves, uh, Defense Metals, uh, we are miners. Uh, we're looking potentially uh, to partner with those that want to go further uh, downstream. So it is it is very exciting, the times for Rare Earths, uh, not just the government interest that you mentioned and and, su and support, even though somewhat soft uh, in North America and Canada in particular, particularly, and I mean just the, the numbers, uh, we're going to need uh, you know much more than that um, globally, um, much more than what has been put forward in order to develop uh, a significant and resilient uh, rare earth supply chain. Uh, bring us up to date uh, with the latest at uh, Defence Metals. Uh, your uh, project is uh, close to uh, the centre of British Columbia, just off of uh, Prince George. Uh, you're also underneath the Discovery Group, which has uh, had, um, uh, you should say, if it, it's had some success in uh, developing uh, projects. Yes, uh, so we are very uh, happy uh, to be associated with the Discovery Group. Uh, they've been of tremendous support to us. Um, and, and yes, uh, we are about 80 kilometers from Prince George. Um, that is a good uh, infrastructure. That is a road that goes from Prince George all the way to our property. Not a lot of uh, rare earth projects in Canada uh, can say that. So now that the weather is getting a little bit better, we, prob we, we could certainly drive uh, from uh, Prince George to, to achieve the deposit. So we are about 40 kilometers away from Bear Lake. So in terms of infrastructure, it's a, it's a pretty, pretty strong uh, project. Right now, we are at a pre-feasibility level, um, and, uh, and that's going to be a significant milestone for the company. Many of the large funds have been waiting uh, for these studies, a more accurate study compared with the preliminary economic assessment. And, um, and it's, going, it's going well. So we have also made recently, today we announced changes uh, in, in our board, um, bringing people with different expertise uh, in mining, uh, market, and, and so forth. Um, and, um, and in terms of uh, ESG, uh, the other parts of, uh, of ESG, in terms of governance, as I said, really making a stronger board, uh, in terms of uh, the social part, uh, we have very good uh, relationship with First Nations, and we have announced agreements recently uh, with McLeod Lake uh, Indian Band, and um, and they actually have an equity position in the company. And in terms of environmental studies, they're going well, and we're progressing on that as well on that front, which is significantly important for our pre-feasibility study. So we look forward to be able to put a pre-feasibility study hopefully this summer, um, and uh, and continue moving. Uh, the project production. Louisa, thanks for your time. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for having me. My name is Michael McRae. You're watching Kiko Mine.